Amen. Um, forgive me just for one second. I'm getting some, uh, I'm about to make an announcement and I'm getting a, uh, I'm getting a text right now. I have to give you some, um, some sad news tonight. Um, our, our, our brother, um, my brother, our brother, um, Pastor Locke of our uh, Liberty campus passed away last night. He's gone home to be with Jesus. This was a hard, hard kick to the gut. Um, I loved him as well as many of you, and um, he was a young man, just turned 50, and um, he was my friend, and um, so we were trying to make a decision as to what to do, because as of like an hour ago, the family was leaning towards a calling hours on Wednesday night from 6 to 8, and a, thurs uh, a funeral of Thursday morning from uh, 10 to 11, and um, I just got a text, uh, from Bishop, who's going to be doing the funeral. Um, they are leaning more towards a Thursday, 6 to 8 calling hours, and Friday, 10 to 11 calling hours. So I was literally getting ready to cancel service next Wednesday. We were going to cancel. Did you already, are you still able to preach next Wednesday? Can you preach the following Wednesday? That's the way, that's what we were really hoping that we, we could work all that out. Um, so here's what the plan is. Um, look, I, I don't know if you knew him, um, but I knew him, and he was the real deal. He was a, he was a friend. He was a brother in arms and um, one of our brotherhood, and I absolutely adored this man. He had uh, asked me to preach for him at a men's retreat for him, and I had asked him to preach at one of our men's retreat. We just trusted each other, and we loved each other, and I'm asking you this. Um, I would love if you could make it to either the next Thursday, the, the 21st, from 6 to 8, if you could make it to the calling hours or to the funeral uh, at 10 to 11, um, with the funeral being at, at 11. Um, hopefully, we'll have a confirmation, but it looks like we're leaning towards that. If we have to cancel this, I, I just so thank you, thank you guys for being so gracious. Um, we've never had this happen. We've never had a campus pastor um, pass away. The funeral, the calling hours, the funeral will be at Coitsville campus. It will all be at the Coitsville campus. It's the only campus large enough to facilitate um, this funeral. Um, I don't think that it will go back to Wednesday night, Thursday, but if it does, thank you for being flexible, you two ladies especially, but we will make the whole campus known. Uh, we will we'll, we'll give you all the information in the morning as soon as possible, but um, can you just join me real quick, uh, not real quick, but just one last time and just praying for the Beecham family. Um, Miss Gloria, his wife, they have um, two young children, Patterson and Naomi, and uh, Pastor Locke has an older son named Brandon who is in Italy, and he's, he's traveling back, um, making his way back even as we speak. But Heavenly Father, we love you, and we love Pastor Locke. We love him. We love his precious family, and Holy Spirit, I'm asking that you would just comfort him, comfort them right now, comfort uh, First Lady Gloria, comfort uh, the children, even as they're mourning the loss of their dad and her husband. I, I pray that you would, just, you would just cause there to be sweet peace that just ref refreshes them and strengthens them, even, even tonight in their grief. Father, even in the middle of their grief, I know that you're there. Would you, would you comfort them, Holy Spirit? And Jesus, we know this, that your word teaches us that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And Lord Jesus, I just ask that you would give our brother a big hug and a kiss from us. Let him know we will see him soon and we will carry on and keep the faith while we're still here. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. Um, thank you all for praying, continuing to pray for our family. Uh, in Liberty as well. Pastor Mike Anderson has been named the interim pastor in the meanwhile, so Pastor Mike is already doing a phenomenal job. Please continue to lift him up. Um, it is an honor and a privilege to invite to the pulpit, um, well, bless you, to invite one of our um, elders uh, of Victory Christian Center tonight. He will be teaching us on the shield of faith. Uh, it's one of our favorite subjects around here, and so would you give a warm Victory Christian Center Warren Campus welcome to Elder Nick Bonai as he comes to minister the word of God tonight. Hallelujah. 
Isn't God good? Amen. Amen. Well, like Pastor Michael said, we're going to be continuing with our series on the armor of God, and I'm going to be talking about the shield of faith. But before we get started, I just want to share something real quick with you. While we were worshiping God, and I was just in the back just worshiping God, we're talking about God's faithfulness. And the Lord just began to remind me, uh, as many of you or most of you may know, we spent many years on the mission field. And there were times that we spent months where we had no running water. There were times we spent weeks with no electricity. But God was faithful. There was a time when I laid in, intens in intensive care in the hospital and the doctors had completely given up hope, but God was faithful. And really, that's what we're, we're talking about, you know, the faithfulness of our God, faith in our God, faith in his word, that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So I just encourage you as we just, as I just share about the shield of faith, if you're going through anything in your life, just focus your attention on Jesus. Because he's the one that will set you free. He's the one that will take care of every need, every problem, every situation that you have in your life, no matter what it is. Because he did it for us. He was faithful in our life. So as we get started, you know, I, I was thinking about faith is one of my favorite subjects, by the way. I love the subject of faith. And when you think about faith, as I was thinking about faith, you know, we begin our Christian walk. We know we are saved by grace through faith. That's how we begin our Christian walk. And as we walk through life, we're to walk by faith. And then when we come to our end, you know, our eternity rests in our faith in God. So our whole life is a life of faith. And that's what Pastor Michael has been teaching on Sundays. But I want to start out by just reading one more time the scripture in Ephesians 6, 10, 18, concerning the armor of God. And I've read this. I, as I was preparing for this, I probably read this scripture, I can't tell you how many times, dozens and dozens. And every time I read it, I, I, something else jumps out at me. But it says this, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. I want you to notice these key words. It's the power of his might, not our might, not my strength, but it's his strength. Put on the whole armor of God. And it reminds us that the armor that we put on is, is God's armor. It's the armor of God. And notice we're the put on the armor of God. So it does us no good to have the armor of God sitting somewhere in the corner. But you have to put that armor on. We put on the whole armor of God that you may be able. And there was another key word there, that you may be able to stand against the, the wiles or the attacks of the enemy. So unless you put on the armor of God, it says to me that you're not going to be able to stand against the attacks of the enemy. And we know that the attacks of the enemy are going to come. They come to all of us. Trials and tribulations, sickness, uh, financial, whatever it be. But those situations come to all of us. But it's his armor that we put on. When he goes on, it says this, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of his darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand in this evil day. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate plate of righteousness and having shed child your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace above all else take up the shield of faith with which you'll be able to extinguish all the fiery darts of the enemy 
I'm going to stop right there because it tells us to take up the shield of faith. So we have a part to play. So often, we're waiting for God to do something where the responsibility relies with us or on us. We're to take up that shield of faith. And that word take up, the shield of faith, means we grab a hold of that shield of faith and we put it in front of us. And it protects us against all the fiery darts of the enemy, all the attacks of the enemy. And we're going to talk about that shield and, and what that shield is all about. But we, we have to take it up. It doesn't... See, the Roman soldier, Paul makes this analogy with the Roman soldier. The Roman soldier carried his shield, usually on his left shoulder, and it was attached to the, the belt of truth as he was marching into battle. But you know, that shield he carried did him absolutely no good unless he took it up and did something with it. Just as our faith will do us absolutely no good unless we do something with it. So we take up that shield. And all that means is this. To take up the shield of faith is to actively fix our eyes on the promises of God. With absolute trust that God is for us and not against us. So we stand on the word of God. We will not be moved. We put our faith, we put our trust. And we've all read the word of God. But sometimes we're waiting for God to do something in our lives where that responsibility lies with us. And you'll see what I mean as we go on. Shield will do you no good if you don't actively bring it to bear. It is not something you just put on and therefore it protects you. You must use it in the way that the shield is more than a, than a weapon, more than a piece of armor, but it, but it is an offensive weapon as well as a defensive weapon. But unless you use it, it does you no good. You know, we, we, I said that the, field of, or the shield of faith is attached to the belt of truth. So it's connected with the word of God. Your faith is connected to the word of God. Your faith is connected to the truth in the word of God. But unless we believe, unless we, and, and Pastor Michael's been teaching this on Sunday. You know, there's that, there's that place between believing and receiving. And it is so good because not only do we have to believe, but there's that place right in between believing and receiving where we're rejoicing, we're praising, and we're thanking God that his word is true. And he's the one who has set us free. And, you know, the enemy attacks us in, in a lot of different ways. We know the enemy's a liar. We know his only weapon is deception trying to deceive you, and he hasn't changed. He's used the same tactics for thousands of years. He used the same tactics when he attacked Eve in the garden. And as I was doing reading through this study, it was interesting. There was four, four main ways, really, that he attacks. And it's good to know these four main ways. And the first one is, and I'll give you the four. The first one is temptation. That's what he did with Eve in the garden. He tempted Eve with, by saying, did God really say? Did God really say, don't do that? Did really God say, don't take that drink? Did God really say, don't look at that site on the internet. Did God really say that? I mean, what harm is that? I mean, just, just one drink is not a problem. God didn't really mean you couldn't. And that's how he tempts us. He leads us into sin. But he's very deceitful and very deceptive. He leads us right down until we start reaching for and grabbing and entering into sin in our lives. Did God really say and when I was reading over that, you know, he wants you to what he what he's trying to do is get you to walk away from the word of God. To step into sin and enjoy the, the pleasures of sin or what we assume are the pleasures of sin. 
And that's the way he deceives us. He tempts us. And one of the other ways he does is by accusation to accuse the brethren. And I know, I don't know, I know I've experienced that, and I'm sure we all experience accusation or being accused by God. Now, what do I mean by being accused by God? This is the, have you ever done anything wrong? Every one of us can raise our hand. Have you ever missed it? Have you ever sinned? I mean, come on, we, we've all been there. So the minute you sin, the minute you fall into that sin, that temptation, you give in to that temptation, oh, God can never forgive you. Now, what you did, man, you're going to hell. God can never forgive what you did. And we all have a past before we come to know Jesus. And if you're like me, you're not proud of your past. <laughs> I'm certainly not proud of my past. But the, the devil comes to accuse us and tell you, you're not worthy. God won't forgive you. But, you know, we need to remind him that I'm set free. I'm forgiven by the precious blood of Jesus shed for me. I no longer am a sinner. My sins are washed away. My sins are forgiven. And we don't have to be accused. We don't have to receive that from the enemy. We can just, devil, you're out of here. You know, but that's one of the ways. He tempts you. He accuses you. What are one of the other ways? He brings doubt. Doubt into your mind. Tries to get you to doubt the word of God. Oh, by his stripes you were healed. And then you may be feeling as sick as a dog. But the word of God says, well, maybe God, maybe that's not for everybody. And we begin to doubt the word of God in our own minds. We get to roll those things and entertain those thoughts. Because how does the enemy come? He brings thoughts to our mind. That's how the enemy attacks. He brings thoughts to your mind. The mind is the battlefield. And if he causes you to begin to doubt the word of God, those are all arrows that the, that the enemy uses. Those are all the fiery darts that the enemy uses. But if you have your shield of faith where it is supposed to be, out in front of you, it will stop all the fiery darts of the enemy. Every one of those fiery darts. See, you have the breastplate, you have the helmet of salvation, but you have your shield out here. None of that junk's even going to come close to you. And the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, they'll protect you if they get past your shield, but they shouldn't get past your shield because your shield of faith should stop all, all the fiery darts of the enemy. So it's temptation, it's accusation, it's doubt. And the third or fourth one, I should say, is anxiety or worry. You know, it causes us to worry about, oh, what am I going to do? You know, we had, we had plenty of opportunities to worry when we were on the mission field. You know, having no water, what are we going to do? Having no electricity, what are we going to do? We never ran out of candles. We had a lot of candlelight dinners. But God was faithful. You know, even when finances were difficult, God was faithful. We always had what we needed. And that's our God. That's your God. And I wrote this down because this was, we can't believe or have faith beyond our actual knowledge of God's word. Let me say that again. We can't believe or have faith beyond our actual knowledge. And we know that faith begins where the will of God is known. But you can't have faith beyond your actual knowledge of God's word. So if you don't know God's word, you can't have faith to believe. That's what that's saying. You know, and you have faith. You know, sometimes we're trying to get faith, and I need more faith, and, oh, Lord, we pray for faith. But guess what? The Word of God says in Romans 12, 3, 
Accordingly, God has dealt to every man a measure of faith. He hasn't given you or me more faith than he's given you. He hasn't given Pastor Tony more faith than he's given you. You have a measure of faith. So that means you have all the faith you need to accomplish all you need to accomplish. Now, can you grow your faith? Yes. Can your faith become stronger? Yes. But you have all the faith you need. And you grow your faith by using your faith, by exercising your faith. If you never use your faith, then you'll never grow your faith, and it never does you any good. You know, it's one thing to say, I believe, but never exercise your belief in the Word of God. Never stand in faith. So we can't believe or have faith beyond our actual knowledge of God's Word. And when I read that, I, that just jumped off the page at me, thinking, you know, because we hear so much about faith and faith in God and all these mighty men of faith and heroes of faith. But you know what? They had a knowledge of who God was. You know, probably the three most important things or two most important things is, number one, the knowledge of God's word in your life. Knowing who you are in Christ Jesus and knowing who Christ Jesus is in you. If you get a hold of those three truths, man, you'll walk through any situation, any circumstances, because I know who I am. I know I have the life of God on the inside of me. I know I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I know he is my everything. He is my supplier. I know I can do all things through Christ. You know, and when we have that attitude and we go through life with that attitude, there's nothing that the enemy can throw at you if you have that shield of faith out in front of you. Now, the shield... It's interesting. There are two different kinds of shields that this Roman soldier carried. And one was a, a round shield, which was used mostly in parades and things like this that they, they carried around. A very decorative, ornate shield. You know, and it was probably about two, three feet in diameter. It was a big shield. But it wasn't used in battle. The shield they used in battle was interesting. It was called a scutum. A scutum. S C U T U M. A scutum. And this shield, interesting, it was about four feet high and about two and a half feet wide. Four foot high, two and a half foot wide, and it was circular in design. So when those blows or attacks of the enemy came, that shield was able to deflect, deflect those arrows or that sword away from his body. It was interesting. It was an interesting study. So four foot high, two and a half feet wide, and weighed about 20 pounds. That's why he carried it on his shoulder attached to the belt of truth. Because, of, you know, it's not something you just st stroll around with. But when it was there, when he needed it, it was ready for battle. He took off that shield, put it down in front of him. He can get down behind that shield, and it would protect his whole body. And nothing, all the attacks of the enemy, that shield would stop. And it was interesting. It was made of just layers of wood, kind of like plywood. You know, just it was put together with multiple layers of wood. And then it was covered in animal hide or leather. And it was covered with about six layers of leather. And then it had some you know, decorative trim around it, but it was covered with about six layers of leather. And that shield would stop anything. I mean, you take that that wooden shield, cover it with six layers of hide. One, you know how tough leather can be. So times six. That's how strong that shield was when it, the blows of the enemy would come and try to strike that 
soldier, he was behind that shield. It would deflect all those blows. It's interesting. The more I read about the, this shield, it just became more interesting. This was the, the, what they call, referred to as the battle shield. Amen. <laughs> but there's some interesting things about this shield. Was every day these soldiers were taught. They oiled this shield every day. Because, this le because the shield was leather, they rubbed it down with oil every day to keep it soft and pliable. Because what happens to leather if it's out in the sun for a long period of time or you don't take care of it? So they had to take care of this on a daily basis. That leather would begin to crack and shrink and begin to fall apart. So if they're out in battle and they're fighting in a battle and someone was striking that shield, that leather would just, it would just fall off. So every day they oiled that shield. And what's interesting is they compared it or they likened it in our lives to the oil of the Holy Ghost. We need to oil ourselves or our faith with oil on a daily basis by reading the word of God, by studying the word of God. And that's what keeps our faith pliable so it doesn't crack. And we're able to, we're able to stand against all the attacks of the enemy. But I found that very interesting. And another thing they did when they went into battle, they took that shield and they soaked it in water till it was saturated. You imagine that shield is already 20 pounds. Now you soak that shield in water and it absorbs all this water. And then they were ready for battle. The shield had been oiled. The shield, they had soaked it in water and they're ready to go into battle. And the fiery darts were nothing more as when the enemy attacked, a lot of times they would shoot flaming arrows they dip arrows in pitch and fire them at the soldier. And as soon as that arrow hit that saturated shield, that arrow, it would extinguish that fire. A lot of times if it got past that shield or if the soldier didn't have a shield, it would hit the soldier. It may not penetrate the armor, but that pitch would get all over him. He, he would be at, literally be set on fire. So he soaked that shield in water. And that's what it says. It'll extinguish all the fiery darts. That's what those fiery darts are. That's the attack of the devil. It will extinguish all those attacks of the devil, those temptations, those accusations, that doubt, that fear that comes into the, the, our lives. And we all experience every one of those things at one time or another. I mean, it just, we just do. <laughs> And if a soldier neglected to do that, neglected to take care of his shield, then he was susceptible to the, to the attacks of the enemy. You know, that helmet will protect you. That breastplate will protect you. But it should never get past that shield, that shield of faith that you have out in front of you, your faith, your faith in the word of God. And we can apply that, bring it over into our own life. Bring it into, over into today. You know, we're not running around with a shield, but our faith is what keeps us, protects us. Those times in the mission field when we had no water, it was our faith in the word of God. Those times on the mission field where we had no finances, it was our faith in the word of God that got us through. It was those times when we had no electricity for weeks on end. It was our faith. It was that shield that saw us through. Those times when I laid in the hospital, well, not times, one time, thank God. It wasn't time. One time was plenty. But when I laid in the hospital for that 
week or I don't know how long it was, two weeks, 10 days. I'm not <laughs> I was semi-conscious, so I really don't even remember. But I remember a lot of the story afterwards. But you know, when, 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 the, when the doctors had said, and I know I, I've shared this before, but I'm going to share it again because I just feel that some of you need to hear this. And maybe some of those listening online need to hear this. But you know, when we stand upon the word of God, when, when we're told, when my wife was told, there is no hope. I had seven doctors. Everything from a heart specialist to a kidney specialist to a, I don't know wh uh, who all they were. Uh, but I had seven doctors as I laid there in the hospital. And they told her straight away, right away, that no one in his condition has ever lived. That's what they went. Thank God for a faithful wife. Because she stood upon the word of God. And she says, no. No, the word of God says. And she reminded them with the word of God. He will live and not die. And the doctors, I, I know, thought she was absolutely crazy because she prayed throughout that hospital. She prayed in the spirit, prayed in tongues the whole time I was in intensive care. She just prayed in tongues. And, you know, it got so bad that my heart was failing. My kidneys were failing. My veins had all collapsed. So then they could no longer put an IV in my, in my arm. They had to actually cut my arm and fish out a vein in order to put in an IV because that's what a sad state I was in. And they had totally given up hope. They said he will either die of heart failure or diabetic coma or I don't know, they just went through a list. There's no way he can live. And I don't know, you know, but God, that's what I do now. God is faithful. So ma no matter, and that's why I say no matter what you're facing, no matter how big, how little, what kind of situation you're facing in your life, God is faithful. And the word of God is true. And you can stand upon the word of God. And you can remind God of his word. God, you said. And I know that's what Debbie did. God said. God said that by his stripes he was healed. God said he will live and not die. God said he will fulfill all that he, you called him to do. And she would just constantly, daily, just remind God of what he had said. God, this is your word, not mine. And God is faithful to honor his word. And it came to the point where I don't know what day it was, when finally, I remember, I remember coming to her, coming out of the consciousness, I came, you know, I woke up, I guess, because like I said, I was semi-conscious, and they had, had IVs in me, and I just ripped out all these IVs, and they said, oh, he's going crazy, you know, <laughs> so they thought I was flipping out or something, but anyway, I woke up, opened my eyes, and when I when I was going through all of that, I was flopping around, ripping all the IVs out. They all come running. When I opened my eyes, there was six, seven doctors, nurses, interns standing around my bed. And they were just kind of looking. Like, this guy's supposed to be dead. What's he doing? And they were just, they were just looking at me. And they said, and I remember the one young intern. It was a Catholic hospital we were in. And they believed in miracles. Didn't always believe, you know, all of the word of God. But they believed in miracles. And I remember the one young intern just looking at me intently and saying, you're a miracle man. <laughs> and I, I can remember saying to him, without a doubt, I said, no. I said, but I know the miracle man. And his name is Jesus. And it was within another day or so that they brought me into a room and I stayed another, what, almost week? Another week and just to get my strength back so, because I was so depleted. But 
the testimony of that whole thing was how God used that. How God used that situation. That every day we would have doctors or nurses coming into our room saying, Pastor, will you pray for us? So we prayed for all kinds of things. <laughs> we prayed for the doctors. We prayed for the nurses. Because they recognized and they believed in God. They believed in the power of God. But that was the, the testament, how God took that situation and used it to bless others. And God will do that in all of our lives. You know, in your life, my... God is no respecter of person. It was simple faith in the word of God. Faith in that shield, that that shield of faith was before me. And all those fiery darts of the enemy, no matter what they were, sickness and disease, lack, anxiety, fear, that shield deflected them all. And that's what your shield of faith will do in your life. When you plant your feet and when you trust God, when you believe God and not be moved by what you see, not be moved by how you, uh, how you feel, not be moved by what other people say. So it doesn't make any difference. The only thing that matters, and I used to tell people, you know, when I used to travel, in the, well, when I traveled in the Philippines, the word of God, your Bible, is the final authority. There's no higher authority. Everything else, everything else has to line up under the word of God. So no matter what you're going through, no matter what the situation, it has to line up under the word of God. God's word is truth. And truth is not determined by whether you believe it or not. Truth is truth. You know, some people say, well, I don't believe that. don't make any difference. Truth is still truth. Well, I don't believe the Bible. doesn't make any difference. Truth is truth. Well, I don't believe God heals today. Well, sorry, you're talking to the wrong person. <laughs> because truth is truth. You know, truth is not determined by whether you believe it or not. So we find out what the Word of God says. And then we plant our feet on the Word of God. We establish the word of God in our hearts and we're not moved. You know, another interesting thing that in, in this study that I found out, not only that the shield of faith was made up, but guess who our shield is? You know, this was interesting as I was, because I never really saw this before. But the, the image of a shield is everywhere in Scripture. It's not just in Ephesians. God talks about the shield or a shield in multiple places throughout the Bible, in the Old Testament, in the Psalms, in, in Proverbs. Uh, and just I just want to share with you a couple of them. You know, when we read, and these are all familiar Scriptures, but I never really saw this before. But when we read that, Abram believed God and his faith was credited to him as righteousness. Genesis 15.1. We are told in Genesis 15.1 that God himself was Abram's shield. And it says this, after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision saying, do not be afraid, Abram, I am your shield. Your exceedingly great reward. God said, I am your shield. He is our shield. In Psalm 91, we're all familiar with Psalm 91. In verses 1 through 4, let me read that. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in him will I trust. Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the pest, uh, pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers, and, in, and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth 
shall be your shield and your buckler. His truth shall be your shield and your buckler. And again in Proverbs 30, verse 5, every word of God is pure. He is a shield to those who put their trust in him. He is a shield to those who put their trust in him. And when I saw this, I'm thinking, God is my shield. What can get past my shield? And we read in the word, if God be for us, who can be against us? For God is my shield. God is your shield. So if God be for you, who can be against you? What can the attacks of the enemy bring to you if God is your shield? He is your protector. Man, when I saw that, I'm thinking, praise God. You know, I was ready to do a happy dance. You know, there's one thing to have a shield, but there's another thing to know that God is my protector. Anything that comes my way, God stands before me. God is the one that goes before us, and the Scripture tells us that. That he's the one that goes before us. He's our shield. He's our protector. Hallelujah. So no matter what you're going through, no matter what you're enduring, no matter what situation in your life, God is your shield. Thank you, Lord. And to me, that was a revelation. You know, it's one of those kind of things you read these same scriptures over and over and over again. But how does faith come? By hearing by hearing, by hearing, by hearing. And every time I read them, I heard something different, and I saw something different. And all of a sudden, the lights began coming on, and my faith began to rise. And I became stronger and stronger. And that's how you grow your faith, by putting your faith and trust in the Word of God. You know, we get... So much of the time, what happens is we're waiting for God to do something in our lives. And I've said this before, and I know Pastor Mike always said this. But we're waiting for God to do something that he's already done. We're begging God to do something that he's already done. Oh, God, please. And God says, by my stripes or by his stripes, you've already been healed. I am your provider. I will supply your every need. But God, please. And we're begging God sometimes. I mean, we saw this, or I saw this. Well, we saw this in the Philippines all the time because that was part of their religious tradition. It wasn't believing what God had already done, but it was begging God. And they would spend their time begging God, oh, God, please. I'm saying, what are you, what are you, what are you doing? Well, we need this, or we need God to supply this. Then begin to thank him for it. Begin to thank God. Thank you, Lord, that you supply my every need. Thank you, Lord, that I am healed by the stripes of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. You know, let our lives be a life of praise and thanksgiving. I love what Pastor Michael is teaching because I never really saw it before. You know, you, you believe that you receive. And that's wonderful, and that's true. But there's that place in between. That place in between believing and receiving. That is rejoicing and praising and thanking. A life of thanksgiving. And man, when he was teaching that, that just, I never saw it before. But it makes so much sense. I believe the word of God. I believe I receive. But what do I do in between? What do I do while I'm waiting for the word of God to manifest in my life? We rejoice. We live a life of thanksgiving. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that your word is true. Thank you, Lord, that every situation, every circumstance is, is taken care of because of your word, because I believe. Therefore, I thank you. We rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord. So God, God is our shield. And we have to believe what God has said. The more we believe, 
the more the shield becomes effective in our lives. The more you stand upon the word of God, the more you use your shield of faith, your faith will grow. You know, you begin by believing God even for the smallest of things. And then when you see God's faithfulness, then you move on to bigger things. You know, just like, like I said, we, we learned this stuff because on the mission field, really, because we didn't have any other choice. Uh, we went to the mission field with no plan B. That was when we left Warren, Ohio in 2003, right? Uh, we sold everything we had. What we couldn't sell, we gave away. Packed three suitcases. And we headed off to the mission field. And we said to each other, we have no plan B. If this doesn't work, <laughs> or if we miss God, we're in trouble. But you know what? God is faithful. God was faithful even in those times when we had absolutely nothing. I remember our first trip was to England where we lived for six years. Let me tell you about the faithfulness of God. We went there. We had, we knew nobody. Well, we knew a couple of people. I shouldn't say nobody. We knew a couple of people. But we had no place to live. We didn't know where we were going. We didn't know the area. And as soon as we arrived, we had a couple tell us, oh, that's funny. I had a Christian businessman just come to me that bought an apartment, and he wants to rent, rent it. And he's a brand-new Christian, and he wants to rent it to a missionary. I'm thinking, are you serious? You know, and there we were. We had an apartment. This really... Same day we got there, we arrived. We had an apartment. And one of the things I remember that Debbie loved in our house was we had a gas, two gas fireplaces. I had one upstairs and one downstairs in the basement. And she loved to sit around that fireplace and just read the word of God or read a book or you know, just relax in front of that fire. And she said, you know what? I don't really miss the house, but I'm really going to miss that fireplace. And when we got there, this Christian businessman said, I don't know why I did this, but I just bought this gas fireplace that I'm going to install in your apartment. And he installed that gas fireplace in our living room. I mean, God is faithful. Even when, I mean, I can testify to the faithfulness of God all night long. All night long. Even when we, we thought we were going to have to leave. We thought we were going to have to go home after only being there for six months. We had no plan B. We said, well, if we, we had no money left to pay for the apartment. We had no money left to pay for our utilities. So what do we do? Well, we'll go home. No, we're not going to do that. I said, if we walk to church every day, and the church was about a mile down the road. So I said, well, I said, if we have to sleep on the floor of the church, that's what we'll do. We know God brought us here. And God hasn't told us to go home. So the fact that we have no money <laughs> is immaterial. That's God's business. My business, your business, is to be obedient to the word of God. And when we're obedient to the word of God, he'll take care of the rest. And when we made that decision... The craziest thing started happening. I mean, I say crazy, but it was God. We had no money for rent that month. And I'll remember at 9.30 at night, one night, there came a knock at the door. And some lady standing at the door. She was on her way home from work. And she stopped there and says, well, first thing Debbie said was, because in England, this was in England, you invite somebody in for a cup of tea. Oh, would you like to come in and have a cup of tea? No, 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 I'm on my way home. God told me to stop here and give you this. And she handed Debbie an envelope with a sum of money in it. 
Now, there wasn't enough for the rent, but it went towards that rent. And it was a short time later. I don't know if it was another week or day. I don't remember the time frame. But we had another knock at the door. About the same time at night, a lady shows up in her pajamas. I'm thinking, what is going on? Would you like a cup of tea? No, no, no. I was climbing into bed, and the Lord wouldn't let me. He said, I had to come here and give you this. And she handed us another envelope with another stamp, sum of money that went towards our rent. And then we were down at church the next day, and the church had a Bible school, and I was, I was teaching some classes in, in the Bible school. And there was a Bible school student there, a lovely girl. She was from Ghana, West Africa. And she came up to Debbie and said, you don't know me, but your husband teaches one of our classes. The Lord says I was to give you this and hands her another envelope. That envelope was enough to pay our rent and pay our utilities for that month. And from that point on, we never had to worry about finances. We always had more than enough to pay our rent, pay our utilities, and be a blessing to others because we made that decision. All right, I'm not going to pack up and go home because I know what God had said. I know God said that I'm to be there. You know, just like when we come home this time from the Philippines, I know God said we're where we're supposed to be. So I'm not going to be moved by circumstances or situations. Okay, God, I know he will provide. I know he'll take care of it. See, that's what faith is. That's what your shield of faith does. When you hold that shield out before us, when God goes before you, and that's exactly what that is saying, that shield of faith. God goes before us, and nothing can penetrate that shield. Anything that come against us. If God be for you, who can be against you? You need to keep reminding yourself of that. If God be for me, who can be against me? Man, when you get a hold of the word of God and begin standing upon the word of God. I don't know how it works. All I know is God is faithful, just like we were singing tonight. And God reminded me of his faithfulness in all those years that we were on the mission field, 15 plus years. We had absolutely nothing. There were times when we had absolutely no support. But God. But God. Why? And I believe with all my heart it's because we were obedient to the word of God. And when you're obedient to what God has shown you or told you to do, if God's told you to whatever, go here, do this, give this, when you're obedient to what God has, he'll bless you over and over and over and over and over and above. Whatever you can ask or think or believe. It's God. That's your God. That's my God. Hallelujah. Stand up on your feet. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Now lift up your hands to the Lord. Now I know every one of us is believing God for something. We're standing in faith for something. And I don't know what it is. and I don't have to know what it is. But I just want you tonight to enter that place between believing and receiving and just begin to rejoice and thank God. Thank God. Thank you, Lord, that your word is true. Thank you, Lord, that if you said it, I know it's true. And begin just to thank him and rejoice in him because his word is true. Thank you, Father. 
thank you, Father, that every need is met, Father. And, Father, I just pray tonight for, for everyone here and everyone within the sound of my voice and those listening by the Internet. God is true. His word is is alive. His word is faithful, and he is faithful. So no matter what your need, what your circumstance, what your situation, your God is greater. Your God is greater, and your God will supply every need in every situation, no matter what the problem, no matter what the situation. So plant your feet upon the word of God, and don't be moved by what you see, by how you feel, or what the circumstances may say. Only believe what God has said. Go to the word of God and find out what he has said and not be moved. For if God said it, then you can believe it. And that's the bottom line. You know, I remember something. I wrote something down that, that uh, Kenneth E. Hagin said once. And I just want to share it real quick as I, as I close. If I can find it here. He said this. As long as Satan can keep you in unbelief or hold you in the arena of reason. Listen, as long as Satan can keep you in unbelief or hold you in the arena of reason, he'll whip you every time. Get a hold of that. As long as Satan can keep you in unbelief or, or hold you in their reason, in the arena of reason, trying to figure it out in your own head. What am I going to do? He'll whip you every time. But if you hold him in the arena of faith and the spirit, you'll whip him every time. Because there's nothing greater than the, than the name of Jesus. And if he can keep you in the arena of reason. Because how does Satan attack? He attacks our minds. He brings those temptations, those accusations, that doubt, that fear through the doorway of our mind. And then as we meditate on that junk, it gets down into our heart. And then we start saying those things that we, that we feel rather than what God has said. You know, we start magnifying those things. Let me say one more thing because this is a lesson I learned in the Philippines and I went throughout the Philippines teaching this message. And it has to do with magnifying. You ever use a magnifying glass? You know, not the burn ants or nothing like that, but use it. I use it to read the, some of the labels on some of these bottles sometimes that, or recipes. I can't even see the writing. I use a magnifying glass. But what happens when you use a magnifying glass? Oh, it makes it bigger. So you know what happens when you talk about your problems? and your situations, and your circumstances. You magnify those problems. So what happens? They get bigger. And sometimes what seems to be or could be a very small problem all of a sudden looks real big and overwhelming. Oh, what am I going to do now? But you know, if we would put down that magnifying glass and start magnifying our God, and start praising God and thanking God, our God becomes bigger. Because we serve a big God. And all of a sudden, that problem, that circumstance in your life begins to look very little. That problem is not big at all. So tonight, if you take anything away, keep that shield of faith in front of you and magnify your God. And you'll see those problems, those circumstances have to line up under the word of God. For there's no greater authority under heaven or earth than the word of God. Amen. Thank you. Glory to God. Thank you for uh, that word, Brother Nick. Um, you can be seated. I just want to give you a couple more updates. Um, the reason I stepped out. Um, was uh, I was just confirming with, uh, with what was happening for Pastor Locke's uh, funeral. It does appear that they're leaning towards a Thursday and a Friday uh, of next week, so the 21st and the 22nd. Um, so help me, do, do me a favor, kind of stay tuned to your emails over the next couple days. 
um, stay tuned to the news report. Check the obituary out. It'll be confirmed, and we'll, we want to just make sure that nobody slips through the cracks. We want to make sure that um, everyone stays communicated to. Um, something I learned early on in ministry was called the ministry of presence, and all of us can do this. A lot of times we don't know the people who we're going to support. Um, and I've said this to many people because they don't know what to say at the funeral. They get there and, the, and it's just awkward. But you're just your presence. You being there comforts them and allows them to know, look, somebody cared for me. And if you don't know what to say at a funeral, here's something simple that you can say. I'm so sorry for your loss. I'll continue to pray for you. And just go, go on. Give them a hug. Give them a touch and just let them know that you'll be there. So um, keep an eye open, an ear open for the announcements. Um, we'll make sure that everybody has communications. As it is now, it appears that next Wednesday is intact. We'll just go ahead with the schedule as it is. I'm so sorry that we had to go back and forth, but this is unprecedented, and it would have been the right thing to do had it been that um, we needed to cancel tomorrow night. But um, amen? You all learn anything tonight? <clears throat> hey. How many of y'all have been in a snowstorm in a snowball fight? Anybody? Anybody? Ever? I got hit in the head one time with a snowball, and um, and it reminded me of something that Brother Nick was talking about. We used to we used to have those you know those metal garbage can lids. We used to use those as shields when we were growing up. We'd throw with our right hand, and with our left hand, we'd hold up the shield, right? And um, like the shield of faith, I had a lot of confidence in this thing. Like, yeah, I'd, you'd storm the other igloo with, you know, snowballs as long as I had my shield. But if I didn't have any shield, man, I was going to get pelted. And it's just like life and what he was talking about tonight. Your shield is the word of God and, and your confidence. Every time one of these lies from the enemy comes, the confidence comes from being able to extinguish those fiery darts. No, no snowballs to the head. Amen? Amen. Amen. So use your shield of faith every time the lie of the enemy comes against yourself, against your body, against your, uh, if symptoms come, you just, you respond like Jesus responded to the fig tree. Guess what? By his stripes, I am healed. If it comes to your paycheck, guess what you say? He touches your pocketbook. You begin to say, all of my needs are met according to his riches and glory. You're going to be broke. Nope. All of my needs are met according to his riches and glory. And they don't get into your head. Amen? Amen. So go rejoicing and yield, yield using your shield of faith. We will see you uh, on Sunday. God bless you. Have a wonderful night.